So what I then wanted to do is to talk to you about how we over the next five or ten years might be able to use the fact that we now have the genome sequence of our closest extinct relative of the Neanderthals to try to find out what makes modern humans special in the sense that we and not the Neanderthals and not other forms of now extinct humans developed culture and technology that started changing extremely rapidly allowing us to become eventually millions and billions of people and influence a large part of the biosphere today. But before that, then, I want to remind you about the fact that Neanderthals, to the left here, was this robust forms of humans. They appear around 400,000 years ago in Western Eurasia and Europe, live there, until they become extinct around 40,000 years ago, generally in conjunction with that modern humans appear on the scene. And our laboratory is then sort of obsessed, if you like, with studying the Neanderthals from a genetic perspective. And you may wonder, why should we be so interested in Neanderthals? And I think that one of the main reasons for that is that they are our closest relatives. So if we somehow want to define ourselves as a group or a species, it's really them that we should compare ourselves from. So from a genomic perspective, that has now become possible since there have been developed and techniques to sequence genomes from small bones like this little toe bone um, that is around 50 or 60,000 years old so that we now have, from that bone there, a very high-quality Neanderthal genome, actually, about 50-fold coverage, so that each position to which we can map short DNA fragments are covered on average 50 times over. That has been possible not only from bones like that, but from even smaller bones. This is a little finger bone found in southern Siberia in a cave that we were very surprised to find out that it was not a Neanderthal, not a modern human, but something else, which we call Denisovans, that is related to Neanderthals, but very far back, 400,000 years or in that order. So we now have good genome sequences both of both these closest relatives of present-day humans. And that has allowed us to compare and infer things about the history of modern humans, for example, that when modern humans then appeared in Africa, started expanding into Eurasia around 50, 60,000 years ago, they mixed with Neanderthals probably several times. In addition, they mixed in the Far East somewhere with Denisovans. And the consequence of that then is that if your roots are in Europe or Asia, you can sort of walk over chromosomes from different individuals here and identify fragments that come from Neanderthals. And as you can see, different people generally carry different fragments of the Neanderthal genome. They add up to something like 1 or 2 percent of the genome. And there is sort of publications almost monthly now finding associations between Neanderthal variants and either susceptibility to disease or uh, sort of protective alleles that involves many conditions such as hypercoagulation, many skin diseases, but also things like depression or so on. But what I think will be most fascinating actually then over the next five or ten years is in a way to ask what we have not gotten from the Neanderthals. So one thing you can now do is sort of walk over the genome, chromosome by chromosome, plot here the frequency with which people in Europe in red and people in Asia in green have Neanderthal DNA at these regions. And you can then look for regions where you statistically would expect contributions from Neanderthals, but you don't find any. And you can identify such regions so, for example, on one chromosome here, on chromosome 7, it would be regions like this, where you see in Europeans you have no contribution, in South Asians, East Asians you don't. And if you go to Papua New Guinea, where you have both the Neanderthal contribution and this Denisovan contribution, 
this region has again resisted. There seems to be negative selection against contribution from these other forms there. And these regions seem very interesting to us because it's then possible that sort of some genetic background to functions that really are unique to modern humans hide in these rather large regions. And what would such functions be? Do we think that it would be such functions? Well, one can debate that, but I have the feeling that there is something special with modern humans. So the stone tools say that Neanderthals make at the beginning of their history and at the end of their history, over 400,000 years, look pretty much identical to the untrained eye, at least. Whereas with modern humans, we don't really have to be experts to convince ourselves that they are technology 100,000 years ago and today is, is quite different. There are other things, so technology changes rapidly. There are other things that come with modern humans, such as figurative art that really depicts something comes with modern humans. And modern humans are the first group of hominins that also start spreading across over open water come to the Americas, come to Australia, and every little island in the Pacific. So a dream then is that some sort of biological background for this ability to develop this rapidly changing culture would be found in changes in the genome that are present in everyone or almost everyone today, but are not there in the Neanderthals. And with the genome now, we can sort of catalog these differences. And the fascinating thing to me is that there are not that many, actually. So it's about 30,000 changes that fulfill the criteria of being present in almost everyone today, but not be there in Neanderthals. And I think this is where I think there will be a lot of interesting things to be found over the next decade. And when it's just beginning to scratch the surface of this, or just to give you a feeling for in what direction this might go, I'd like to talk a little bit about the very few amino acid changes that fulfill this. It's just 96 amino acid changes. They fall in 87 different genes. So the first question you may, of course, ask is, which are the most important ones? Where would you start? And you already noticed we have a bias. We think sort of that modern humans are special in terms of cognition, so we think things that have to do with the brain might be important. So if we just among these genes look at the ones that are highly expressed in the sort of part of the brain and in the developing fetal brain, then there are five proteins there that are highly expressed in the sort of epithelium where, where you make the cerebral cortex. Three of these five proteins, surprisingly, turn out to be part of the spindle and the kinetochore, so the machinery with which chromosomes line up during cell division and are then pulled apart. So it was very surprising to us that something so basic as sort of segregation of chromosomes might have changed in modern humans. Sort of speculated a few years ago that yes, there are indications that the stem cells, how they differ uh, divide exactly, determines how many neurons you form and maybe also the types of neurons. And this was pure speculation, but we are now beginning to be able to sort of add some substance to this. And this again comes from what we heard this morning, another breakthrough, which was this, uh, what Dr. Shinya Yamanaka presented, the ability to make induce pluripotent stem cells from somatic cells that you can in turn differentiate to different types of cells, but also to these three-dimensional organoids. So for example, brain organoids, where you can then study aspects of early brain development. So we have compared in our lab the, these organoids to fetal brain and find that they replicate quite well early stages of brain development. We also make organoids from chimpanzees and find that they look very similar to human brain organoids. But there are some differences then that you can detect. And interestingly, if you look at the stem cells here in the apical part of the epithelium that divide, you will see in time-lapse photography here how the chromosomes line up and are pulled apart. 
by this spindle uh, apparatus. And if you compare the length of this stage where they line up the metaphase, you find that it is longer in the human stem cells than in the chimpanzee stem cells. And this difference is actually specific to these stem cells. You don't find it in other human and chimpanzee cells that you compare to each other. So that's then quite interesting to think that it might have to do with these changes here. So what we then want to do is, of course, to use another breakthrough that you heard about earlier here, CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing. You heard Emmanuel Charpentier talk about that, and she shared the prize two years ago with Jennifer Dudna for this technology. So what one wants to do is to put these changes now into iPS cells and make these organoids and see if these changes are responsible for this. What you may also want to do is to put this into, say, laboratory mice, where you can then, it's not a human, but a, uh, but a mouse, of course, but you can get an adult brain. And I want to illustrate that also mice might be useful for this in the future by one other gene that we studied a lot over the last 10 years now. And it is this gene that is involved, was found in a three-generation family where a severe language and speech problem segregates. And a group in England identified the gene. It encodes a transcription factor called FOXP2, so a protein whose function it is to turn off and turn on other genes. Interestingly, the protein has two amino acid changes that are specific to humans relative to chimps. And if we compare it to the Neanderthals, they actually look like humans. So these two changes happen here in the common ancestor of Neanderthals and modern humans. The protein is quite conserved, though, so you, what you can, all the way to the mouse. So what you can do is take the mouse and, by these technologies, humanize the mice so that it now essentially, from its own FOXP2 gene, makes a human protein. So you then have a mouse like that that might have a phenotype that could have to do with speech and language. So you try to speak to the mouse, and nothing happens. But you anyway, have a model that you can start studying. So you can, for example, look at dendritic trees in different parts of the brain. And you actually find that the humanized mice, compared to their litter mates, have bigger dendritic trees in certain parts of the brain. And that's particularly in these corticobasal ganglion circuits that have to do with motor learning. So that finding then stimulated a graduate student, Christiana Schreiweis, after she finished with us, to go to MIT and work with Anne Graybill on motor learning in these mice. And they did experiments where they had the mouse go in a maze to try to find a reward and get a cue here, say a light signal, to say go to the left. There was the humanized mice were not better in how fast they learned this, but it then comes a point, if you always give the signal to the left, where you can take away the signal. And the mouse has simply automated this thing. I always go to the left and I get my chocolate milk, which is what they get. So it turned out that the humanized mice, when we compare them to the litter mate then, learned this in seven to eight days of training, whereas their wild-type litter mates take 11 to 12 days. So they are a bit smarter, these mice, so particularly in sort of automating motor learning things. So I'm not a neurobiologist, but the neurobiologists tell me that this is sort of a model for, say, the type of learning you do when you learn to bike as a kid. In the beginning, you think about what you do, and you're really bad at biking. And then comes the time when you suddenly stop thinking about what you do, and that's when you get good at biking. And this sort of switch sort of goes together with a switch of activity in the striatum to the medial part, to the lateral part of striatum, so we went back to the mice and checked this, and we see such a switch also in the mouse. So this now leads to the current hypothesis for this, that these two amino acid changes change something in the circuits in the brain, to allow for sort of faster automation of motor activities. And it's very tempting to then speculate that this, in fact, has something to do with articulation. Because 
articulation is probably the most sophisticated motor coordination thing we do as humans. We have to have millisecond control between vocal cords, lips, and tongue to produce speech. So I think this is very encouraging for the future then, that we will be able to use stem cells and organoids, but perhaps also laboratory animals that are more easy to manipulate and also study in the adult tissues to sort of address questions about other genes that have interesting changes in modern humans that have to do with brain function or, or brain development, at least these genes do. And the question will be if these changes also influence that. So to end up then, I, the picture I sort of make is to say that now when we have the Neanderthal genome, it's very useful because we can sort of see what changes happened before and what happened after. And for the next few years then, I think that perhaps focusing on the functional consequences of these changes might be particularly interesting because they may tell something about why humans took off on this historic trajectory that's so unique among primates. And that the way forward there will then be to use induced pluripotent stem cells and organoids and editing, but also then to some extent to use humanized mice. And with that, I then thank you for your attention. Thank you. We have time for a question or two. I see one there in the front. So you've looked at the effects of uh, mutations in express proteins. Um, and their potential in development of humans. But have you also looked at regulatory elements that could drastically change expressions of a, like broadly, especially proteins that might have been involved in the brain? Yes, I think you're right, and I should have pointed out that, uh, that there are sort of, in the order of three, 4,000 of these changes that are fixed in humans fall in what's potentially regulatory changes. We just started scratching the surface there too. We've taken um, 25 of those changes in just a simple reporter construct in, in three different neuronal cell lines. And actually 12 of them turn out to cha change their enhanced reactivity, at least in this sort of crude assay. So I think one will find things there and they may even be more important than the amino acid changes or at least be more of those changes. I think there will be a lot to do there, yeah. Over here. Um, could you discuss if it's possible to understand whether modern humans outcompeted uh, Neanderthals and Denisovians or absorbed them mm -hmm. uh, into our population by th through interbreeding, mm -hmm. um, if there were more humans uh, mm -hmm. in the same time, for example? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, in some sense, if you now go through sort of the thousand genomes genomes and a couple of other thousand genomes we have and see how much of the Neanderthal genome can you puzzle together, how much of it is still there, it's in the order of 40-50% of it. So they're not totally absorbed in the sense that all of the genetic variation as sort of all, all, all the genome haven't come over. So I think it was quite limited interbreeding and there are also some indications that there may have been problems in the hybrids. So if you look in these regions where you seem to select against Neanderthal contributions, it's particularly genes in the male germline that are located there, statistically the most overrepresented group. So I think it's fair to speculate that it has something to do with modern human behavior that these other groups disappear because everyone disappeared, like the Nisavans, as you say, Neanderthals, this hobbit in Indonesia, every other sort of groups in Africa disappeared. It has something to do with us, but what? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Perbo.